Then I would like to welcome Ruth Harvey. Please come up and we give the words to you. This is actually better, I think. So if you want to, uh, that's right here. Yes, good. Do you need anything else? No. No? Good. I think that's the order. So we're going to be the first deck. Great. So it's wonderful to be here. My name is Ruth. Ruth Harvey, and I hope you can understand my English. I come from Scotland, but I'll try and speak as clearly as I can. If for any reason you want me to slow down or say that again, please just wave your hand. I have a few slides um, to illustrate ah, what I'm going to say. Hooray! Does anybody recognize this beautiful landscape? Has anybody been to Iona? Yay! So, this is um, the north end of the island of Iona on the west coast of Scotland, looking out towards, looking north towards Mull and Sweden, and eventually northeast to Sweden. Um, I'll say more about this place in a moment. But it's wonderful to be here and to be here um, at this great historic time as your churches come together. I bring you greetings from the Church of Scotland. I work for the Church of Scotland and I have for the last five years worked in the southwest of Scotland in particular. So I'm a minister in the Church of Scotland, um, but I actually live in England. <coughs> oh! <laughs> And so, um, and that's not unusual. Um, there aren't many of us, I suppose, but they're in the border between Scotland and England. There is a lot of movement backwards and forwards. Um, and I live just in Cumbria in the Lake District. Have you been to the Lake District? Yes, so you know where I mean. It's northwest. People talk about living in the northwest. They mean the northwest of England. Really, the northwest is much farther north in Scotland. Okay, but before I go any further, are you in... Ah, this is just to show you Hadrian's Wall. Somebody at lunch was talking about Hadrian's Wall. It does exist, as you know, and this is the boundary between Scotland and England. However, I wondered if you wanted to sing with me. In Iona, in the Iona community, we sing. And here is a song that is a, a parable for our times. Now, I did have... A great, very authoritative translation in Swedish, but I think I might be too shy to try it. Behold, behold, var horsod. Is that behold? So, okay, you get the idea. Behold, behold, it's from the book of Revelation, I make all things new, beginning with you and starting from today. Behold, behold, I make all things new. My promise is true, for I am Christ the way. And if we're thinking about folia, to follow. Christ is the way that we follow. So this is the song. Let me sing it and then if you feel like joining in, join in the second time. Does anybody know this? The music. Great. Well, join in if you know it. Here it goes. You can follow my hand if you like. Behold, behold, I make all things new, beginning with you and starting from today. Behold, behold, I make all things new, my promise is true. Listen to this, for I am Christ the way, all together. Behold, behold, I make all things new, beginning with you and starting from today. Behold, behold, I make all things new, my promise is true, for I am Christ the way. Thank you, wonderful. This is a song we sing at home. 
And it's a song that is, for me, a parable of our times. The words are taken from the book of Revelation. Behold, I make all things new. So the words are familiar. The tune is new. And what I find brilliant about this song, maybe you know it, is that there is a second part written especially for people who say, as often in our churches, oh, I can't sing. And sometimes they might say, I can't sing more than two notes. And so John Bell, who wrote the music to this tune, wrote a part with two notes for anybody who says they can't sing. And maybe if we have time, we can sing it later. is new. The truths about which it sings are eternal and it speaks of these truths in a way that embraces those who feel they can't sing, who feel they are excluded. Ultimately this is a song that binds us together in a common act of the worship of the one God in whom we all believe. It combines centre with fringe, fearful with confident, traditional with contemporary. And if I had a prayer for our churches across the world, in Scotland and in Sweden today, it would be that we could follow Jesus, that we could follow Jesus into these borderlands and there find renewal for all. And it's my belief that as the song makes clear that if we follow Jesus, we follow him not because he is the guide, but because he is Christ the way. Okay, something slightly less prosaic. Here is a map of Scotland. It's a little bit out of focus, but you get the idea. For those of you who don't know Scotland well, um, I live, I work in the area where Dumfries is marked on the map, but the southwest pocket of Scotland, but I live just across um, in Cumbria, the E of England and a little bit north is the Lake District. And you can see here that there is a border. And so the theme, I guess, that I wanted to explore with you is what happens when we follow Jesus into the borderlands. Where all those nice mixtures in our song take us. In the southwest of Scotland, the churches there have been working to discover a deeper understanding of what it means to be ministers in a church for the 21st and 22nd centuries today. A ministry without walls, if you like. And I'm going to share a bit more about this in the seminars. But for those of you who have, are familiar with this report, Church Without Walls, um, the vision for what we're doing in the southwest of Scotland is contained in this. And I have copies for you if you'd like it for a few. But I'm going to say more about that in the seminar. For now, I want to focus on what it means to follow Jesus into the boundary lands because I think there are at least three reasons why it can be inspiring for us and it is vital to follow Jesus. And the three reasons that I offer, but for now I offer these, is that first of all, I argue that Jesus is already there in the borderlands. Jesus is already there in the borderlands. Jesus inhabited borderlands in the way he was born, in the way he lived, and in the way he died and rose again. In the Gospels we read that Jesus came to the Sea of Galilee early in the morning and that he appeared to Mary early on the first day. In that liminal space between night and day, which we call twilight or dusk, when the mists hover and the half-lights guides our seeing and our discerning. In his life and his ministry, Jesus was already a boundary dweller. He took himself to spiritual and to physical limits and boundaries to the desert and throughout the wilds and the cities and towns of Galilee. He embraced people who were already on the margins, tax collectors, prostitutes, outcasts. And neither was Jesus afraid of the liminal space between church and world. His was a ministry boldly questioning 
the assumed authorities of the day, religious and political. In his birth, Jesus crossed boundaries as a refugee fleeing to Egypt. In his crucifixion, Jesus was taken outside the city walls and he appeared to his disciples on the Emmaus Road as the day was almost over. At the other end of time, between day and night, between life and not life. He also sends us out to the farthest limits. He commissioned the 72 to go ahead as apostles, to exercise a ministry of availability among far-flung folk. And that is a ministry to which he calls each one of us, a ministry of availability to all. So Jesus inhabits those liminal spaces. Do you know the word liminal between the, the here and the not here, between life and death? He is the mediator between God and between humans, between each one of us and those beside whom we sit. He journeys with us between life and death. I've already mentioned this place, Iona, and I chose this slide because within the Iona community, we have um, a very strong sense that we live between the here and the not here, if you like. And we talk about Iona as a thin place, a place where the boundary between things spiritual and things material is very thin. As thin as gossamer, you might say, the spider's web image, strong but almost invisible. And there are places in our world where, and you will know them for yourself in your own experience, I'm sure, places where the space between things spiritual and things material, the physical world and the spiritual world, is very thin, almost non-existent. And I guess that's what I get a sense of when I think of Jesus' ministry, that he dwelt and ministered in that liminal space, in that thin space. So I would argue that we follow Jesus into the boundary places because he is already there. The second reason we um, follow Jesus into the boundary places is that many of us are already there as boundary dwellers. This may be familiar to many of you. You're way ahead of us in terms of ecumenical work in Sweden. But recently, I was at a meeting in England um, with a group of clergy. And we were a small group, 20 of us. And we were talking about our latent ecumenism, what kind of ecumenism we bring to the table. So we named the different labels that we had owned in our lives. And although the group, apart from me, were all Anglicans, Although there was a homogeneity about the group now, without going very far back into our history, we discovered that between us we had experiences of Methodism, Presbyterianism, of Judaism, of Baptists, being Baptists, of Evangelicals, there were Pentecostals in our group, Roman Catholics, and there were people who had experimented with other faiths as well, also Hinduism. Some had been atheists in their past, others had been agnostics. Not one of us in that group was pure anything. We all had dwelt and moved across many boundaries already in our lives. Each of our denominations is wonderfully and colorfully mongrel if we scratch the surface. And I guess you are a fantastic example of that. How, what, what is it that holds us together? Our, our denominations are incidental in many ways. We cross the borders all the time. What draws us together is our faith. This is not to diminish the rich gift that each tradition, each denomination brings to the table, but it is to remind us why we're here, that we're not here because of the church, we're here because of the kingdom. Heidegger talked about a situated epistemology, a happenstance, if you like, a thrownness 
We happen to have been born in a particular country, in a particular place, with a particular gender, gender and with a particular religious tradition. It's our happenstance. It does not define us purely. And I believe also there are many of us who look outside the traditional churches to find religious and spiritual sustenance. In the UK, we need only look to the Fresh Expressions movement, to the emerging church movement, to new monasticism, to find interesting stories of people moving outside <clears throat> traditional church culture to find spiritual sustenance. And there's a wonderful book by David Tacey called The Spirituality Revolution, which documents this movement in great detail, along with work by people like David Hay on understanding the spirituality of people who don't go to church. Fascinating. So I, I would argue that we need to follow Jesus into the boundary areas because many of us are already there ourselves. I happen to belong to the Church of Scotland, but I now also belong to the Religious Society of Friends, the Quakers. And that is an easy, I, I find that an easy double belonging. I've also mentioned that I belong to the Iona community. I think of myself as having a triple belonging, three legs of one stool, if you like. If you knock one of them away, I topple. Each are important to me to remind me that none are that important, that my deeper belonging is to my faith. The Iona community has a five-fold rule, and we meet together to talk about our prayer, our um, use of time and resources, our money, and our work for justice and peace. In discussing these different things, we find ourselves at the edge of the church. And I believe that's where Jesus calls us, not because he wants us to build church, but because he wants us to build kingdom. George MacLeod, who founded the Iona community, had this to say about the focus on kingdom rather than church. I simply argue, said MacLeod, that the cross be raised again at the center of the marketplace as well as on the steeple of the church. I am recovering the claim that Jesus was not crucified in a cathedral between two candlesticks, but on a rubbish heap outside the city between two thieves. He was crucified at a crossroads so cosmopolitan that they had to write his title in Hebrew and in Latin and in Greek, or shall we say in English, in Swedish, and in Portuguese. At the kind of place where cynics talk smut and where thieves curse and where soldiers gamble. Because that is where Jesus died and that is what Jesus died about. These are the words of George MacLeod. So we follow Jesus into the borderlands, firstly because he is there and secondly because many of us are already there. And finally, a reason why we follow Jesus into the borderlands is because many of our churches are already there. And again, you are leading the way, as far as I am aware, in this, in this venture. While your example in Sweden is very inspirational to us, and I want to say here publicly, thank you to you, for the hard work that I know must have gone in to get you to this place now. Nevertheless, there are other examples, as you know, around the world where there are uniting churches. And we take inspiration also from India and from Australia and from other parts of the world. In the UK, at least the parts that I know, there is some degree of cynicism about what we call the ecumenical movement. There is a degree of weariness, you might say, about what we call the ecumenical instruments, the structures and the committees and the bodies that are designed to help our churches work together. And there is a certain realistic degree of cynicism about the difference between simple interdenominational sharing and a deeper and a wider and a broader belonging together on the ecumenical journey. Part of the cynicism that I've heard is that the motivation for ecumenical work 
is really only to do with money, finances, simplifying structures. We're in decline anyway, so we might as well be in decline together and just get on with it and be a little bit more um, straightforward. Now, this is one extreme, and it's not the only place, but there is a degree of that in the UK. But there is another story also, and there is an ecumenical movement formally in the UK going back over a hundred years to the radical student movements, youth movements, ecumenical movements, and I think there's an organization called Chris in Sweden, which is part of that, and there will be others, part of the World Student Christian Federation, which spawned many, many different organizations worldwide, way outside the churches. And my experience in the southwest of Scotland is that the cynicism does not hold true. That there is a desire among ordinary folk in our towns and in our villages to work closely together because it's where God is leading us. Yes, of course it makes sense. Yes, of course it's practical. But God is already out there engaging in mission. Let's just go and join in. I mentioned already that I live in Cumbria, and there I work for churches together in Cumbria. And there is a fantastic example in that county of how three of our bigger denominations in the UK are working together more closely, crossing that boundary, exploring what it means to be churches together. The Anglican Church, the Methodist Church, and the United Reformed Church in Cumbria have signed a year ago at what they call a Declaration of Intent agreeing that they will, know, they will work strategically together to share ministry, to share buildings, and to share mission. And that means that on the ground, when there is a vacancy in any one of these three denominations, they will work with their colleagues to make it an ecumenical appointment and will refabricate, reform church, which is always in need of reformation. So you will recognize that in that tiny little snippet of a story in Cumbria, behind that, there are lots and lots of very late in the evening conversations about the interchangeability of ministries and the sacramentality that we can share or cannot share, about the commissioning services and the new patterns of ministry that we want to evolve. But we are working carefully and with energy in Cumbria through these differences in order to be one so that the world may believe, not so that we can save money. And so I would beg to say that to all those cynical voices, um, there is another story. We believe that Jesus calls us to be one. In the southwest of Scotland, I was working for five years with a collection of churches trying to discover what training needs were there among the people in the pews and to offer training back into the people in, in the pews. And we discovered very quickly that the most effective way to do this, to use our resources most effectively, was to do this with our Scottish Episcopalian neighbours, with our Methodist neighbours, with our Baptist neighbours. And so we've begun to do that. And so we're trying to reform our ministry in that way. This kind of work, is, and the work you're doing here in Sweden, is not radical work because it hasn't been done before. It is radical work because it's taking us back to our roots from whence we came and reminding us that renewal comes when we follow Christ who is the way. In all of this, we are called to follow Jesus into a church or into a kingdom without walls. And this Church of Scotland report, which is now almost 12 years old, is a great gift to us in, in the Scottish context in this journey. This report reminds us that we follow Jesus and he calls us to follow him. And the call is this, that we will be shaped by the gospel, that we will be shaped by our locality, by where we live, by the ground on which we walk. We will be shaped by friendship, and by friendship which goes well, and by friendship where there is conflict. That will also shape us. And we'll, we will also be shaped by the gifts of the people of God around us. Shaped by the gospel, 
shaped by our locality, shaped by the friendships we have, and shaped by the gifts of God's people. And these are the four threads that run through the Church Without Walls program. And so finally, Jesus did not call us to build a church. Jesus calls us now to follow him. This is a magnificent and a daunting and a thrilling calling. But it may also be a fearful calling. Where is Jesus calling us to follow him? And to what is Jesus calling us? Who and what will offer resistance to this calling? And how will we meet that resistance? We may need to live without a map and without always knowing what our destination will be. And we will need to embrace our fears and our doubts if we are to have strength for the journey. But if we remember that Christ is the way rather than the destination, and if our aspiration is to be followers with integrity rather than authority figures wielding power, then perhaps we can trust the journey. And perhaps we can trust that the journey will be one of light and of new life for each and for all. For behold, I make all things new, beginning with you and starting from today. Thank you.